And I'd like to welcome all our virtual members who are watching all over and who are tuned in uh, each week here at Beth that and I. And we'd like to just thank you all for coming out today, those who are here. And we at Beth Adonai uh, honor your presence. And again, we welcome all of you. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who has made us holy through his commandments and commanded us to actively study Torah. Please, Hashem, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouths and in the mouths of your people, the house of Israel. May we all and of all May we and our offspring and all our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, may all together know your name and study your Torah for your sake of fulfilling your desire. Blessed are you, Hashem, who teaches Torah to his people Israel. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all the people and given us the Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of the Torah. Amen. All right, all over the world, there are some who resolve in making a New Year commitment and changes uh, in the hope to improve their lives. Today, I would like to challenge and encourage each of you to examine this coming year by first seeking what exactly uh, does it mean to be a Talmudian or a disciple of Yeshua? Now these are exciting and great times in the Messianic Judaism community. There are recent uh, reports from uh, Messianic rabbis all over the world where many Jewish people are accepting Yeshua as their Messiah, especially in the land of Israel. Uh, isn't that just wonderful news That's, uh, to hear that? So it is incumbent, uh, incumbent as believers that we prepare for the overflow of new believers to train them in the way of Yeshua. So as we go into the teaching, I want to, uh, us to examine uh, this teaching from an Eastern point of view, a worldview. Uh, rather than a Western point of worldview, we will we'll be looking back as far as the first century and some cases even further. So let us start uh, with our first slide. If somebody can get that TV on back there, please. Uh, Okay, this uh, verse in Matthew 28, 19 uh, from the complete Jewish Bible will be our foundation of scripture that we use. Uh, it said, therefore, go and make people from all nations into Talmudim, immersing them into the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Ruk HaKadosh. Now, think about this verse for a moment. As a believer, this verse, in a sense, is giving us a commandment to do an action. An action. Yeshua is giving his disciples instruction to go and make disciples of people from all nations. So let us examine in more detail of what our master rabbi Yeshua meant. To do so, let us first understand discipleship uh, as it was uh, during his time. Uh, what then is a disciple? What does it involve? What does it look like? And what does it really mean to be a disciple? Well, the word Tamid, tamid uh, has to do with a student of a sage. Uh, it's in an 
unified uh, uh, title given to one well versed in Jewish law. And in effect, it's a Torah scholar. It referred generally to any student, pupil, apprentice, or adherent as opposed to a teacher. In the ancient world, however, it is more often associated with people who were devoted followers of a great religious leader or teacher of, of philosophy. So let us uh, look at two scriptures from Isaiah 8, 16 as we kind of look back into how that look up uh, discipleship is formed. So buying up the testimony, set, seal the teaching among my disciples. And Isaiah himself uh, had disciples. And so we want to look at and examine those. And also Isaiah 50 uh, verse 40. And so Adonai Elohim has granted me the ability to speak as a man well taught so that I with my words know how to sustain the weary. Each morning the awaken, he awakened me my ears to hear like those who are taught. Excuse me. Uh, and that's in Isaiah 54. So it's a type of scroll that's a legal evidence. Seal the official records of God instruction and give it to my followers. So we're looking at the word followers here, uh, which uh, means to learn or to instruct as uh, may indicate that Isaiah have, have built a circle of disciples whom he personally instructed and whom he could uh, promulgate his teaching among many in the nations. As Watts said, uh, it seemed that Isaiah wanted to uh, deposit his treasures of warning and teaching with his disciples. That is uh, why he may not have had a former school as we see in the case of Elisha in 1 King 20 and 35 and 2 King 2, uh, 3 to 15. He nonetheless gathered uh, around himself certain men and uh, passed his teaching out to them. Now, when uh, Yeshua uh, said, go and make disciples, it was a Jew speaking to other Jews in a Semitic dialect. Uh, as such, these, those words had a very specific meaning and in, in, embodied a well-known paradigm that first century Jewish listener well understood. Since then, those words have been translated into Greek and into Latin and before being translate, translated into constraints of the English language more than over a thousand years later. Now to fully understand what Yeshua said, we first need to disconnect from our traditional Hellenistic understanding of those words which is, as we know, easier said than done. And then ask, how did Jews who first heard those words, we have understood them. Only then are we in a position to ask what might those words mean for our disciples' uh, efforts today. So let's take a look at what were the roles of the rabbi. Early first century Jew Jews uh, knew that the scripture had authority over all aspects of life. 
God may have uh, been a mystery to them, but behavior was not. Furthermore, it was a scrupulous behavior, not condition of your heart that defined a righteous person. Thus, many Jews had a desire to honor God by doing all the right things. In the world of Phariseeism, rabbis were the teacher who had been given the authorities a role to in interpret God's word for the living of a righteous life. That's defining what behavior would or would not please God. That were willing submission to authority. If a rabbi ultimately agreed to a would-be disciple request and allow him to become a disciple, the disciple to be agreed to totally submit to the rabbi, rabbi's authority in, in all area, areas of interpreting the script, scriptures from his life. This was a culture given uh, for all observant Jews, young men, Jewish young men. Uh, sometimes each truly wanted to do it. As a result, each disciple came to a rabbinic relationship with the desire and a willingness to do just that. Surrender the authority of God's word as interpreted by his rabbi view of scripture. Let me say that again because it's important to understand what they did. Those disciples surrendered all their authority over to the rabbi of God to, for them to give them God's word as interpreted by the rabbi's view of scripture. Now, uh, let's consider uh, John the Immersion. Uh, some may know as John the Baptist. Uh, and his tamanine. Uh, now, this is taken from the first fruit of Zion in Volume 4, Chronicle of Messiah, under John's Disciple. Uh, and it states, like all other sages and teachers of Torah in the first century, Judaism, John the Immersion had disciples, which are students who committed themselves to his mentorship and memorizing his words and his teaching. They loyally follow him in his journeys and they consider him a true prophet. John disciples spread the message of the immersion uh, and summoned people to repent and be immersed. Now we can picture John the Immersion seated on a rock beside the water with his long haired school of disciples, uh, which uh, are known as Beth Yokanan, seated in a semicircle around him. He was solemnly, solemnly teaching them the ways of repentance, the mystery of Isaiah prophecy, and the coming of the Messiah, uh, Messianic kingdom. When suddenly he stopped, start uh, short and rises, his disciples rise with him as he direct their attention to anonymous strangers passing through the camp of his disciples. The master is passing through their midst. In a reverent hush, John gazes over Yeshua and is slain. Behold, the Lamb of God. John's disciple strained and peered to catch a glimpse to whom did their teacher refer to at that time. They were looking for a great sage of a zealous hero. Yeshua from uh, Nazareth drew no attention to himself. No halo hovered over his head and his eyes were not a vibrant blue. Nothing distinguished him from anyone else in the crowd at Bethany. Only John knew. John saw the dove that descended upon him. 
Then John told the disciple, This is he uh, on behalf of whom I said, After me come a man who has a higher rank than I, for he exists before me. John 1 and 30. So John testified to his disciple that Yeshua is the Son of God. On the subsequent afternoon, John the Immersion stood with two of his disciples when he again saw the master walking nearby. With his eyes fixed on Yeshua, John said to his young disciple, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples needed no further prompting. They left the Immersion side and followed after Yeshua. During uh, the same period in the first century, there were two other major schools of thoughts and disciples. They were the school of Hillel and Shammai. Hillel and Shammai uh, were the two leading sages of the last century of BCE and the early first century CE who find it opposing schools of Jewish thought known as the school of the house of Hillel and the house of Shemael. The debate between these schools of, on matters of ritual practice, ethics, and theology was critical for the shaping of the oral law and, the Judi and Judaism as it is today. Despite the many dispute that later developed between their respective houses, only five differences are recorded between Hillel and Shemael uh, themselves. In the, in the records of the Talmud alone, there are 316 issues on which they debated. The large number of, of their di di uh, uh, this of that disputation led to the saying the one law has become two. The matter they debated included were a mission to Torah study. The House of Shemir believed only worthy students should be admitted to study of Torah. The House of Hillel believed that Torah may be taught to anyone in the expectation that they will repent and become worthy. On the topic of white lies, whether one should tell an ugly bride that she is a beautiful, that she is beautiful, Shemel said it was wrong to lie. And Hillel said that all brides are beautiful on their wedding day. On the topic of divorce, the house of Shemaiah held that a man may come only uh, may only divorce his wife for a, a serious transgression. But the house of Hillel allowed divorce for even trivial offenses such as burning a meal. When they talked about Hanukkah, the house of Shemir held that on the first night, eight lights should be lit. And then they should decrease on each successive night, ending with one on the last night, while the house of Hillel held that one should start with one light and increase the number on each night, ending with eight. So we can see the differences that those two schools brought and how they taught uh, their disciples and their disciples respectfully followed them in their teaching. But in general, the house of Samir's position was stricter than those of the house of Hillel. On the few occasion when the opposite was true, the house of Hillel would sometimes later recant their position. Similarly, uh, through, uh, though there are no records of the house of Samir as a whole changing, uh, on a, as a whole changing its stance, a few individuals from uh, from it are re recorded as, as uh, deserting a small number of the more stringent opinion of their school. 
in favor of the viewpoint of the house of Hillel. Let us uh, take a look at uh, when we are, uh, where we are here when we're looking at wrestling with the uh, word of God. By the way, these uh, two pictures was taken in Israel uh, back in 2014 at uh, two different synagogues that we attended uh, of what was actually going on uh, with the teaching, the rabbis were teaching uh, their disciples, their students. Uh, so wrestling with the word of God and the yeshivas uh, are groups of disciples intensely dialoguing over an aspect of life and scripture uh, claim on it was a uh, standard part of rabbinic teaching methodology. Studying their uh, rabbi's views of scripture and wrestling with the text to comprehend God's way for the conduct of their life was the main priority of the disciple and the yeshiva experiences. Since all disciples have memorized most if not all of that Hebrew scripture in preparation for that Bob Mitzvah at age 13. The issue was not what God's word said, rather what did it mean and how was it to be lived out. So that's how they approach uh, the scriptures based on the way they rabbis live. There were uh, real life, live, uh, life questions. Uh, were the causal uh, factors in searching the scripture for authoritative direction? For example, everyone knew about the broad no work injunction regarding the Sabbath. But how should that command work in itself out in specific terms? Thus, a real-life question regarding Sabbath observance might be, may I light a candle on the Sabbath, or how many candles may I light on the Sabbath? A real-life question regarding marriage might be, can I divorce my wife if blank, blank, blank? Or a real-life question regarding tax collectors would be, if I... If I know my taxes are going to oppress all people, should I pay them? The rabbi authority, uh, the rabbi would authoritatively address such daily practice, practical questions concerning the righteous living, and that uh, response would understood as coming through the scripture as defined and interpreted by the rabbi. As a part of, of how should we live uh, interactive uh, process, disciples would debate various rabbis' interpretations of the text pertaining to a real life issue. This might involve weeks of dialogue and debate. For the rabbi were no, in no hurry to resolve the issues and questions. However, when the rabbi ultimately uh, did declare his authoritative interpretation on the issue, all debates, uh, further debate deceased. His declared interpretation was known and therefore binding on all his disciples' lives for the rest of their days. As such, the rabbi was the uh, matrix, the filter, the the, the grid to which each and every life issue flow, as well as the lenses to which each life was viewed. So let us shift our gears uh, to our mes Messiah, Yeshua. Large crowd follow our Master Yeshua, but Yeshua did not speak or seek to have large numbers of followers. Instead, he wanted a few 
good men and women who sought disciples. The, go the gospel of Matthew said, when Yeshua saw the crowd, he went up uh, on the mountain. He went on the mountain to escape the crowd so that he could teach his disciples. It said, after he sat down, his disciples came to him, Matthew 5 and 1. When his disciples saw him sit down, they came near to him because they knew he was about to start teaching. The rabbis always taught from a seated position. In the vernacular of the first century Judaism, a rabbi sitting down is the equivalent of a pastor standing up to a pulpit. The phrase, he sat and taught, appear, appears commonly in the rabbinic literature to refer to a rabbi discoursing of a subject of Torah. That explains why his disciples gathered around him when they saw him sit down. It was their job. Discipleship already existed as a as well established institution within Judaism long before the appearance of Yeshua and his follower. All the great sages, the rabbis, the sages among the Pharisees, and the teacher of the Torah had disciples. The Hebrew word for disciples Tamid, a word that really simply means student, and the plural is Tamidim, uh, students. A disciple's job was to learn everything that his master had to teach. Disciples memorized their teacher interpretations, explanations, and exegesis of the scriptures. They memorized the stories, parables, illustrations, and the codings of their teachers as they told them. They learned to practice Torah by imitating their teachers and incorporating this, his manner of observations into their own lives. Disciples kept the Torah the way they learned to keep it from their teachers. And disciples endeavored to become like his or her teacher. A pupil is not above the teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. Luke 6, chapter 40. Excuse me, Luke 6, verse 40. After the disciple was fully trained, he became the teacher and passed on the teaching to disciples of his own, who in turn were fully trained became teachers and raised up disciples of their own. They taught that, that, that the disciple in the name of their own teachers and his teachers and his teacher's teachers transmitting a body of oral Torah as vast as the sea. This was the method of higher religious education in the days of Yeshua. When the disciples saw the teacher sit down, they knew what was expected of them. They had a job to do. So they stepped forward and he began to teach. As a disciple, we had the same job. The teacher is seated. Are you ready to learn? There we go. Now what does it look like as a disciple? Transparency was what it was. Unlike many of our contemporary discipleship programs, we have to remember there was no curriculum or agenda for this multi-year discipling experience. There was no tour like we have now, three books, Bibles. So they had to memorize. 
Rather, it was a continual daily relational living experience where either the rabbi would ask questions of the disciples as he closely observed the disciples' daily life, or the disciple would in, in, uh, initiate a discussion by raising an issue or asking a question based on some aspect of his daily life. In the dynamics of his uh, intimate dis discipling community, all of a disciple's daily life was observable by the rabbi. A disciple would expect the rabbi consistent and persistent questions. Why do you do that? The emphasis was always on behavioral formation, not just the importing of wisdom and related interpretive information. In this interactive manner, the rabbi functioned to clear up great areas of understanding and difficult areas of textual interpretation of the disciples. By always asking questions, the rabbi were concentrating on developmental discernment in the minds of the disciple, not the importance of how-to formulas. Notion of three principles of prayers or four steps to prosperity would be apparent to a first century rabbi. They didn't, they didn't do no first step. You know, point A, point A, B, C. They didn't do it that way. Illumination while not overly required, the disciple invariably had a deep desire to emulate their rabbi. This often includes in, in imitating how their rabbi ate, observed the Sabbath, what he lived, what he liked and disliked, as well as mannerism, prejudices, and preferences. Some disciples would go to uh, extreme length to try to imitate their rabbi. The story is told of one disciple who, who uh, so wanted to illuminate his the rabbi that he hid in the rabbi bedchamber. That way he, he would be better able to illuminate with his own future wife how the rabbi was imitated with his wife. That's kind of strange. But and that's what they did. They, wanted, they, they went to the screen uh, length to do those things. The somatic understanding of a belief, of belief was not based on an intellectual uh, accent to a creed, doctrine statement, or series of faith propositions. Rather, to a first century disciple, believe is a verb in which you willingly submit to your rabbi interpretive authority regarding God's word in every area of your life. Thus to say, you are a disciple in the name of Gamel, meant that you will totally surrender your life to Gamel's ways of interpreting scripture. As a result, you conform all your life behavior to his interpretations. The essence uh, quality of first century disciples were desire and submission and assume that enumeration, biblical literacy, community, transparency, and a willingly to wrestle uh, with God's word were a given were a given these things was, everybody knew this is what we do this include a passion to gather with a zeal to give up any of all their preconceived notion of how to live one's life and to embrace the behavior that the rabbi deemed best to honor God it was a radical, willing, and totally conforming submission to the interpretation uh, authority of their rabbis. That's how they live. 
uh, hard work. In the days of Yeshua, all young boys were taught the Torah and the prophets beginning at age five. Meaning that at age five, they uh, began to memorize the Torah and the prophets. Every day they would rehearse the scripture until it came to them by rot, learning, uh, memorization that is. At the age of 12, after seven years of memorizing the Bible, boys were a apprenticed into craftsmen. Some became carpenters, some stone masons, and others farmers. But those that were exceptional in their studies of the scripture were apprentices to a sage. His trade was to become a rabbi. He would leave his home and move in with the sage. He studied everything about him, not just his thought on the scripture, but he studied the sage's marriage, his business affair, the way he judged certain uh, cases, everything. In the belief of the sage that the Torah affects every aspect of life, so the disciple is learning to imitate his master's discipline life in order to mimic in every regard. This is a biblical discipleship. To a disciple, his master is more than just a teacher. In fact, a disciple master regarded more highly than his own father. This is because an earthly father brought you on into this world in which we live but the sage were able to usher you into the world to come, or paradise. The sage became the new father of the disciple. Hence, we find in the rabbinic, rabbinic writing references to the house of Hillel or the house of Shemal. The sages were seen as a father and his disciples were his well-trained sons. If not, uh, that the disciples' family was uh, abandoned, but his family loyalty took second place to his master. This sentiment is, uh, is echoed in the words of our master, you're sure. As we look at the next slide. All right. When he said, if any man come to me and hate, your, hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. That's what it said in Luke 14, 26. Now, let's kind of break this down. The language here uh, of hate employed in this verse is not hatred like we generally think of it. Yeshua is using a Hebraic idiom that demonstrates comparative languages. In other words, the love for the master must be so great that all family love uh, you the one that's strong, uh, the strongest love that you know of, must look like hatred in comparison. Everybody understand, got that? That's it's, it, your love for the master had to be so strong that in comparison to your family, uh, it looked like hate. Each and every one of us is called to this radical practice of discipleship. Something to think about. We can't be disciples, you sure, because our family has a strong Christian tradition. Or we can't be a disciple, you sure, because of cultural pressure. We can only be a disciple, you sure, if we are willing 
to abandon all other affection to second place, setting Yeshua the Messiah squarely in the preeminent of a role of our life. The absolute, the absolute dedication and loyalty that disciple here for that master is unmirrored in any of our modern institutions of study and in our culture at large. Imagine if rather than just hanging out out of school and having a good time, you begin to illuminate uh, your professor. You memorize his, his or her lectures and quoted him, him or her at every possible moment. You follow him to and from uh, his or her home and often invited yourself to eat with him or her. You began to dress and act like him or her. You sought to absorb every possible nuance of his behavior or her behavior. This may be obsessive, but it's also discipleship. The greatest sage produce carbon copies of themselves. Every disciple fully trained will be like his master. Luke 6 and 40. Sometimes technology don't want to work. Okay. All right. Let's consider your sure ministry. Again, unlike the other rabbis and teachers of Torah in his day, Yeshua spoke with his own authority. He did not cite the opinion of early generation, nor did he speak in the name of early rabbis. He spoke only in his own name and his father. He made simple pronouncements and stated his interpretation confidently and a matter of factly. He spoke more like a prophet, speaking the name of God than a Torah sage speaking in the name of early sages. Uh, I need you to uh, go to the next slide for me. This network. Uh, this also uh, the, one of the pictures uh, from Israel that we took. And if you look closer, you'll see somebody who's sitting on the second row here at Beth and I. And that's, guess who that is? No. Raise your hand. <laughs> Samantha. That was also taken in 2014. Uh, but the congregation at Capernaum received uh, Yeshua teaching well. Mark tells us they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having uh, authority and not as described. As, as we were talking earlier, you can almost see the difference now, how the other sages were have their followers learn from them according to their their teaching. Yeshua was different. He spoke with authority, not as described. So when we hear that scripture again, now we understand what it really meant. This indicates that Yeshua did not transmit his teaching in the name of teachers before him. And the rabbinic mode of teaching, one credible rest, credibility rather, rests upon citing traditions and interpretation from earlier generations. The name, the authority of the scribe and sage rested upon the teaching in the name of a higher authority. Earlier links in the oral transmission. A typical rabbinic sermon might begin with the word Rabbi Elazar said unto the name of Yochanan, being Zachiah, who taught in the name of Hel Hillel, the elder, 
when he had heard from his teacher Abelation. That's how they would do it. If someone got up and said those words, they would listen. If not, they're not listening to you. In one passage in the Talmud, the rabbi refused to receive even the teaching of the great Hillel until he presented them in the name of early teachers. Today, we don't seem to have as much an appetite of wrestling with biblical texts as it relates to the daily issues of our lives and God's authority over them. We seem to prefer simple answers that we can selectively embrace with convenience. Thus, much of what is, it, it means to be a, a committed follower of Yeshua uh, Messiah today is often reduced to simpler formulas of how-to steps. As previously observed, all of us are familiar with sim uh, sim simplicity, genre, with its four principles of humility and five steps to spiritual fear of living. Such an approach would never have survived rabbinic scrutiny in the first century uh, during the yeshiva environment and in most cases uh, today now it wouldn't survive in some of the orthodox uh, teaching being dis discipled by Yeshua was not a quick fill in the blank Bible study he was not Handing out principles, which are a non-biblical word or notion for daily living. He came to reveal God's truth. In fact, uh, this whole Greek notion of biblical principles was alien to the world of the rabbis. It is, a, is, it is, a, it is to a person not a principle that we submit. Now, we do not, we do understand uh, or observe how we develop uh, broad certified surgeons, nurses, licensed electricians, uh, school teacher, biochemistry, counselor, golf player uh, today. Common to each of uh, our long periods of study, training, mentoring, practicing uh, experience, as well as continuing education. Most of you have professional jobs here. You had to go through a lot of training to get your certification, your license, whatever that you had to attain. Some of those training was rig rigorous. wasn't easy. Uh, so this is what we are, are accustomed to, to the practice of placing ourselves under the watchful mentoring oversight of others who have established proficiency in our areas of interest. Ironically, we seem to put four more passion commitment and dedication into becoming a disciple of someone or something than we seem to do in developing and nurturing our piety as committed disciples of Yeshua. Let me, let me say that again because I think somebody missed that. Ironically, we seem to put more passion commitment and dedication into becoming a disciple of someone or something than we seem to do in development or developing and nurturing our own piety as committed disciples of Yeshua. And we need to rethink that. This is part of my challenge. I see it from the outset and encouraging us to take a look, to re-examine that. How can we as disciples 
begin to take that same passion we do with others, activities that we do outside of our scriptures, our living. And some of us, uh, not here, I'm not talking, I'm talking about people in China like Rabbi Rene said, uh, don't seem to have that commitment and passion as dedicated as it should to Yeshua. Thus, we are all disciples of something or someone, be it uh, atheism, career, self-absorption, materialism, or favorite cause, or again, Yeshua. As I close, uh, let me leave you with this, something to ponder. Uh, next slide, please. This overview of what it meant to be a disciple during the time of Yeshua highlighted some of the assumption and the presumption embedded into rabbi-disciple relationship. These first century uh, givens provide us with issues to wrestle with as we ask questions of ourselves and raise issues for our small groups, churches, and in informed community of faith. This wrestling should also include our discipleship programs and ministry. This teaching indicates that, that Rabbi Yeshua had two kinds of followers, the crowd of people and the disciple. Which kind of follower do you want to be? Are you one of the crowd that flocks around him to receive a miracle, a blessing, or a ticket to heaven? Or are you one of the students engaged to learn his teaching and every word that comes from his mouth? Be a disciple. Shabbat Shalom.